good afternoon. Do I say good afternoon or good evening? Afternoon, still. Afternoon, still? OK. <laughs> well, this speech would be so much easier if it were in Portuguese. <laughs> As it's in English, I need a, a paper here to help me with some reminders and some words. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Professor Gustafsson for his kind words. Uh, I'd like to express my gratitude and appreciation to you, Professor, who gave me the opportunity to be here at Villanova University. I'd like to thank the Provost, Ms. McGeady, for his gentle acceptance letter and for his invitation so that I could be here and for this semester be a part of the Wildcat community. I'd like to thank the, the, uh, for all of you who are here. I'd like to thank Professor Raul Hernandez to be here as well. And I hope if I am competent so you could learn something about Brazil, which is a very interesting, as Professor said, and enigmatic country. Continental sized countries are often enigmatic countries. Even here in the United States, which is a very open country, very transparent, you guys have a huge soft power. It's hard to know what people in the Northeast, the Midwest, the Rocky Mountains people, or the West Coast are thinking. Enigmatic countries are big countries. Uh, one other characteristic of Brazil is that it is far. As we can see, Brazil is far from everything. It is located down there in the east central part of South America, surrounded by the Amazon rainforest and by the Atlantic Ocean. By the way, 60% of the Amazon rainforest is located inside the Brazilian territory, 60%. The other 40% is divided by eight other countries. Brazil possesses the longest tropical and subtropical coastline in the world, uh, extending for around 5,000 miles bordering the Atlantic Ocean. Another interesting point that should be noted is that the official language in Brazil is the Portuguese. OK, guys, it's not Spanish. Brazil is the only Portuguese-speaking country in the Americas. And dear audience, Portuguese is different from Spanish. Let me use Professor Raul Hernandez. If I speak Portuguese in a fast way, chances are the Spanish native speakers in, the audi in this audience won't understand me. And the opposite is also true. If Professor Raul Hernandez, for instance, if he starts speaking Spanish very quickly, I may not even know what he's talking about. So it's a different language. And the United States studies Spanish. Spanish is the second most spoken language here. Uh, but the United States does not study Portuguese, which makes Brazil even more distant. Okay? Nevertheless, the United States and Brazil maintain deep and broad economic relations. As a matter of fact, both countries have been doing business for quite a long time. Actually, the United States used to be Brazil's main trading partner in the world. That changed in the last decade when China occupied the top of the rankings. But the United States remain in an extremely crucial position as the second largest Brazilian trading partner. Some very quick historical facts just to position everyone here on this talk, OK? Some historical facts. Uh, going through a quickly overview, starting at the second half of the last century, but calm down, it will last one minute. I'd like to point out the year of 1964. 
In the year 1964, the military overthrew the president elected and took control of the country. The deposed president was accused of being a communist. And that was the beginning of the military regime. This is important for the Brazilian moment. It was 1964. At some point, the military had dictatorial powers. Dissolved Congress, suspended the Constitution, and imposed censorship. The military regime lasted 21 years until 1985. In that year, 1985 was the last presidential election held under the military regime. The election was indirectly through an electoral college though. The civilian Tancredo Neves was elected, but he never took office. He got sick a day before his inauguration and died a few days later. And finally, 1989. In 1989, Brazil had direct presidential elections. It was the first since the year of 1960. It means that, people, it took 29 years from 1960, the last presidential election, to 1989, took 29 years for the Brazilians to regain the right to vote directly for president. Brazil has a mega election on the horizon. Brazilians will head to the polls on October 2nd, in five days. This speech was very well located on time, in five days. Uh, Brazil will elect a president, one third of the Senate, all of the 513 members of the, nation, of the Chamber of Deputies, where I work, all 27 state governors and the state legislatures. Just like here in the United States, Brazil is a federal republic governed under a presidential system. The president and vice president of Brazil are elected together as a joint ticket by popular vote for a four-year term and they are eligible for re-election to a second term. Uh, in Brazil, for president, there is a two-round voting system, and this is important for what we were talking about later on. Two-round voting system. The first round of elections is held on the first Sunday of October, which is in five days. Uh, and if a candidate receives 50% of the total valid votes, or if the candidate receives the absolute majority he is elected. If it doesn't happen, which is very common as we can see, since Brazil, as Professor Lau told us, we have 32 political parties. If no candidate receives more than 50% 50 50 of the vote, runoffs take place on the last Sunday of October. In this case, in this year, it's necessary, it's gonna be take place on October 30th. Brazil has a population of 215 million people. We are the seventh in the world of population after. Would you guys know that? Would you tell me the sequence of the population? Anyone? Which, the, which country has the most? I don't know, so I, I, need, the, I need this. Okay. Ch China has the most. China is number one. Okay, number second. Russia. India, India. Okay, number three, I, I don't, oh, I know. Number three? The US. The US, the US. You guys are number three. Number four, oh, okay, I, I help out, because I have this here. Number four is Indonesia, then Pakistan, then Nigeria, then Brazil. Brazil is the seventh of population, 215 million people in Brazil. Uh, in Brazil, voting is mandatory. We have to vote. We're forced to vote. You must vote, Professor. You have to. I don't want to. You must go. You must vote. Vote is mandatory for everyone from 18 to 70. You have to vote. 
oh, I don't want, to, I, 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 I hate politicians. Okay, go and vote blank, vote new, but you go, you go, okay, you go. Uh, vote is mandatory from 18 to 70. People between 16 and 18, vote is optional. And also for those over 70, is optional, okay? Uh, as I joke here, what if I don't vote? What will happen to me? Okay, if you don't vote, you must justify the reason you didn't vote. You justify on the electoral court website. You have to present documents to prove your justification, and you have to pay a fine. It's easier to go and vote. <laughs> it's easier to go and vote, okay? Well, uh, in the, even though, even with all those penalties, all this work you have to justify just as a, a number uh, to make it, this more clear. In 2018, which was the closest election we have, in 2018, 20% of the Brazilians didn't show up to vote. 20% equals 30 million voters. 30 million citizens did not show up to vote. And this is important in this election, as I will return to this point in some 10 minutes, okay? Both candidates, they are ranking top in, this, in the polls in Brazilian elections for president. Both are trying to convince people to go, uh, to go on Sunday, October 2nd, to go to vote. Even uh, their uh, their base. I'm going to talk about this soon. Let's continue. Okay. First of all, since the redemocratization, uh, redemocrat. I didn't found. I didn't find this word in English. Redemocratization. But even though I brought it here, I mean, redemocratization is the become democrat again. Okay, since the redemocratization, Brazil had eight direct presidential elections. This next, this coming Sunday is going to be our ninth presidential elections. I brought all the final results on this colorful slide so that we compare situations and point out some specific characteristics that I'd like to bring to you guys. Just an observation here, since my wife is over there recording me. My wife commented that this slide was horrible. Gustavo, this slide was too colorful. Too colorful. Oh, bring something more sober to the university. Guys, I agree with her, always agree. I agree. But even though I brought colorful, sorry, surprise. <laughs> because it makes it easier to check the each election. It's, I can say, look at uh, 2002, for instance. The, what color is that? Uh, I, I should have put colors that I know the word, right? <laughs> yeah, what color is 2002? Two, two, purple. purple. Okay, light purple, probably. Okay. All right. Um, Jokings apart, we have here the eight Brazilian elections in the democratic period. And this is interesting because we can take some explanations, some cases, some patterns from the results. And I'm going to bring here for you guys. Okay. First, I, I, it will not take long in each one, okay? Don't, don't, get, don't, don't, don't get crazy. I saw some guys like, oh, oh my, no. One minute each one. Okay, first election, 1989, color, uh, color green. Oh, okay, it's easy because it's first. First one, we had Fernando Color against Lula da Silva. In 1981 was the first election after the military regime. After 29 years, 
it was the first election. We had, Brazil had a lot of people willing to participate, a lot of people wanting to be Brazilian president, Brazilian, uh, Brazilian president. So I put this below 1989, that those 22 is 22 candidates. They had 22 candidates in the election. It's a lot of people. Uh, as we can see in the first round, let's go to first round now. First round, Fernando had 20.6 million, what is 30%, and Lula da Silva had 11.6, what is 17%. None of those had 50%. They didn't got the majority of the votes. So what happened? A second round. So a second round happened in the last Sunday of October between the two that has most votes, between Fernando and between Lula. And now we have a result. We had that Fernando had 53% and Lula had 47%. Going down to next Sunday's election, I can see Lula here again, again. Interesting to mention that if we take a look at all the nine elections that are on the screen, there is a member of the PT. PT is the party, is one of the 32 Brazilian parties. PT stands for Partido dos Trabalhadores, PT. In English, labor, party of the laborers, labor party, okay? In all of the nine, let, let me bring this better. In all of the eight, because we, did, we didn't have this election so far, I, I, I cannot, I know a lot, but I, don't, I, don't bring, I didn't bring my um, bola de cristal, how can I say? Crystal ball? <laughs> crystal ball, yeah, okay, crystal ball. Uh, but we'll talk about those, those two guys here soon. Oh, oh, oh my. That was bad, right? I, 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 I really tried to cover. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> OK. Uh, in all of the eight elections, we had something from the PT, someone from the PT. Fernanda Da, Labor Party, Dilma Rousseff, Labor Party, Rousseff, Labor Party, Lula, Labor Party, Labor Party, Labor Party, Labor Party. The Labour Party is a leftist party in Brazil, a big one, as we can see, an important one, so important that it is in all elections so far, okay? Uh, we will see in five minutes that according to the recent polls, pol polls, 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 uh, those two, Jair Bolsonaro, the current Brazilian president, and Lula da Silva, the ex-Brazilian, former Brazilian president, they are leading the polls. So it's 100% sure that those two guys will be the most votes. We don't know yet if it's going to end up in the first round or if it's going to be necessary the second round. Because a lot of things going on in Brazil, I'm here right now but my mind is over there because I work in the Chamber of Deputies, 100% politics, and we are living all this. Uh, even coming here, when I was arriving here, a senator called us, and because I called him before, and I, I, I asked, Senator, I'm going to speak at the university. Uh, what's new? So he brought some stuff that's not even here yet, but I'm going to tell to you guys. Okay. Let's continue. In 1989 election, there were 22 candidates. A lot of people, Professor Lau Gustafsson told you guys that we had 32 political parties. Yes, Brazil really has a true political party system. Uh, as we search the number of political parties in Brazil on the electoral court website, we found those 32. I took this yesterday. This is brand new. There isn't a 33. It's 32. And why I say this? Because despite these 32 political parties, 
there are another 24 in the oven. 24 to be created, to be uh, waiting for the electoral court to approval their creation. 24 besides those 32. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of, that's a, that's a lot of political parties. That, that's really with this. Uh, and uh, it's also interesting. You may think, oh, come on. They might have two, three, or four big parties. The rest is a small one. No. A proof, like, a proof of that is that uh, in the Chamber of Deputies, uh, there is represented by 23 political parties, different political parties. Or in other words, we have deputies, we have congressmen from 23 different political parties representing the Chamber of Deputies. So they have, they have uh, representation over there. They're, they're not that, that small because they have representation in the chamber. Well, as Brazilian multi-party system has that so many parties, until now, no single party has achieved an absolutely majority after an election. Therefore, they must work with each other to form a coalition government. And there lies the problem. When you have to get together a bunch of different parties, a bunch of different ideas, you have to negotiate with the parties, negotiate ministries, secretaries. Uh, it's not that easy. And, okay, let me go this to colorful again. Uh, Jair Bolsonaro, okay, we are we're living here now, 2018. Jair Bolsonaro won the election against Fernando Haddad from the Labor Party. Jair Bolsonaro had 46% in the first round. No one got 50, so you already know. We had a runoff, and Bolsonaro had 55%. Bolsonaro was elected in a period of a wave anti-establishment in the whole country. In 2018, Brazilians didn't want to talk about politicians. You could stand a politician. So that's where Bolsonaro surfed. In Brazil, we call surf the wave. He got the wave. It was a tide wave, like a tsunami, and he knew how to surf it, and he became president. He was elected telling that he was not going to talk to political parties. He couldn't stand political parties. I will not negotiate with them, he said that. And this is good. Uh, this, I, I studied this thing. If you make a, a poll, if you make a, a, a research, if you make a survey in any country in the world, uh, the question is, which institution I don't trust? Which institution I do not believe, I don't like? Number one, you're going to be political parties in any place, even here, even here. So if one appears telling that he has not talked to political parties, people like that. OK, I like this guy, because I don't like political parties also, either. I like the guy. And he was elected with an anti-establishment talk which was important in Brazil. And I'm going to tell you why. Because we had huge cases of corruption happening. And Brazilians couldn't stand anymore all those politicians doing bribes, bribes, whatever. And that's where Bolsonaro surfed the wave. But let's continue slowly. As my kids say, Despacito. This, is it correct, Professor? Despacito? Yes. Thanks. <laughs> In Portuguese, it's devagarzinho. Devagarzinho. Despacito. See, it's not, it's not so close. Despacito, devagarzinho. Yeah, OK. Uh, election number two, 1994. Ah, before, before. Uh, 
the first election, 1989, Fernando Collor was elected. He, uh, he presided Brazil for two years, and then he was impeached. He got problems with briberies, corruption, and the Brazilian people took him from the office. So he didn't complete his term, okay? That's why in 1994, you cannot see. You can see a Fernando there, but it's not Fernando Collor. It's Fernando Cardoso, another Fernando. Actually, Fernando is a beautiful name in Brazil. We have a Fernando here in the audience from Brazil too, right, Fernando? <laughs> OK. Uh, in the second Brazilian election, Fernando Cardoso won president, oh, sorry, it's, it's not president, won the candidate Lula. And as we can see, only one ground was necessary, see? Look, Fernando Cardoso had 54%, more than majority, he was elected, game over. Then come the third, as I, as I mentioned before, in Brazil, uh, we accept one re-election. The president, Fernando Henrique Cardoso, was, tried the re-election, and he, was, uh, he won the election. He won from Lula again. L oh, Lula is in all of them, yeah. He won from Lula, and that was the third election in Brazil from the Democrat, Democrat par uh, times. Election number four. 2002, we had six candidates. Lula da Silva from the Labor Party, always Labor Party is present, won the election from José Serra. Two rounds were necessary, 46 against 23, and Lula achieved in the runoff 61%. Now I'm going to 2006 election, because I have something interesting too to bring here to you guys. In 2006 election, this one, I can, this one, Lula da Silva was the current president. He tried for re-election and he succeeded. So far, okay. The new thing is, he won from Geraldo Alckmin. They were like ad adversaries, can I say adversary? Uh, on the other sides. Uh, I don't like to say enemies. They are not enemies. Enemies is too much for politics. You're not enemy, but you are adversary, okay? Adversary. Ad uh? Adversary. Adversary. Okay, sometimes it's so hard, those That's good. stress. You did good there. Yes, thanks. You did well. Really? Yeah. You guys are so polite. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, adversary. Adver uh, say again. Adversary. Adversary. The stress is a sa. Adversary. Yeah, it's not easy. Try to learn Portuguese, guys. <laughs> Try to learn Portuguese, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, Lula and Geraldo Alckmin were advers adversaries. Adversaries. Okay, it's okay. You got it. Let's let's say ad. They were ad. And uh, by then, not now. Sixteen years later, it, it was 2006. 16 years later, they are here together. Lula is candidate of, for president, and Geraldo is his vice candidate, his vice. They united against Bolsonaro. In this year election, we have two huge heavyweights. Lula is a heavyweight. Bolsonaro is another heavyweight. So Lula convinced Geraldo Alckmin to be his vice candidate, and they're together to try to beat Bolsonaro, okay? Another interesting thing in the 2006 election is that between the first round and the second round, everything is possible. Everything is possible between the first and second. Even have less votes in the second than you have in the first. Look, Geraldo Alckmin. Geraldo Alckmin had 40 million first round. And he went down to 37.5 in the second. What does it mean? It means that two and a half million people regretted for voting for him in the first. And in space of four weeks, changed their mind 
it not vote in again. Okay? Everything is possible. All right. Let's go on. Uh, election 2010. Now we have another name from the Labor Party against José Serra. Lula in Brazil, guys. Uh, it's difficult to say, but it's, uh, I don't even know the word, even in Portuguese. <laughs> the guy is huge. The guy is respect. The guy was involved with problems. The guy was in prison. He was convicted for nine years, 12 years. He went to jail, and he was there for two years. And then what happened in Brazil is that people probably became afraid of Bolsonaro and said, guys, let's get all we can get. Let's combine energy and strength. Otherwise, you cannot beat Bolsonaro. And so the Supreme Court freed Lula. Freed. Oh, now you're innocent. Yeah. No, it's not like this. They just said, oh, no. A technical problem. You're not supposed to be judged in Philadelphia. You're supposed to be judged in Pittsburgh. So get out of jail. So he got out of jail. Uh, so he's free now. And he's the candidate who is leading the polls. OK? Uh, when Lula left, the ter left his office in 2010, in 2010, he, was all, he had almost 90% of approval. 9-0 of approval is a lot. He made his successor. He nominated, he, he nominated, nominated? He indicated, nominate Dilma Rousseff, who, she, uh, Dilma is, is a woman, and she's not a politician at all. She's tough, she's rude. She doesn't have any political skills, even though she was elected and later re-elected. See the power of Lula. See the power of Lula. OK? Uh, and Dilma was elected in 2010 and re-elected in 2014. This 2014 election was very difficult for Dilma and her Labor Party. What happened here? In the year of 2013, just before the election, in 2013, Brazilians went to the streets. Millions. I mean millions, not thousands, millions, millions. Uh, complaining against corruptions and bribes and all this kind of stuff. The Labor Party got scared. It was the first time Brazil had a huge manifestation uh, a huge, lot of people on the streets in a movement that was not carried out by the Labor Party. They were not in control of that. They got scared. Even though it happens in 2013, June 2013. I was in the Chamber of Deputies by that time. I was inside. It happened in my city too, Brasilia. When, I don't know, 50,000 people tried to invade the, the Congress, tried to invade the Congress. We were inside. We locked the doors. Locked, locked the doors. We didn't know what was going to happen. And boo! We don't want you anymore. Yeah. Kill the politicians. Kill the politicians. Boo! It was, it was a, a, a tough moment. It passed. Came the 2014 election. Dilma was reelected. She was reelected, but with the narrowest, narrowest difference, as you can see here. 42%. Is it, it's 42 because I rounded. If you take the, the, the correct numbers, it's, it was 51.52, something like this. So I rounded for 52. But it's even, even less. Even less. Was the narrowest difference among all these elections results. Dilma was reelected, but she didn't finish her term. Two years later, in 2016, we had another impeachment process in Brazil. Uh, one more time, people went to the streets 
millions of them, millions of them, did we go to? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you were to. Uh, everybody, everyone went to the street. You had to go to the street and was complaining about all kinds of things. One of those, corruption, bribes, no more Labour Party, no more Labour Party, and Dilma had an impeachment here in 2016. Her vice president, Michel Temer, ended the term. Okay. Now comes 2018. As I told some minutes ago, in 2018, Brazil was weakened, sad, distrustful of politicians, an anti-establishment feeling you could feel in the air, could feel in the air. So came Jair Bolsonaro. He knew what to do. He is a simple man. He is, uh, while the other candidates, in 2018, see, 2018, there were 13 candidates, 13. A lot of them with a lot of power, a lot of money, a lot of people working for them. Not Jair Bolsonaro, simple man. No, I don't want anything with me. I do myself my recordings. Ah, I'm Bolsonaro, I'm here, ah, shaking. I'm here. Or when he was going to speak, He's going to re record himself on the back, always the Brazilian flag. But the Brazilian flag was not perfect like this. It was like, like this, <laughs> on purpose. That guy is simple. That I know, I understand what that guy says. I like that guy. I like that guy. OK, he, do, he makes, uh, Luis, how can I say palavrão? How can I say palavrão? Uh, swear word? Swear word? Swear? Yeah, word? Swear word? Something bad? Bad? Yeah. Hey. You were. Swear word? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> he does a lot of this. Some may, some may think, oh, but some, this guy is a person like I am. I like this guy. He's real. He's real. Bolsonaro. And he surfed the wave. He was elected Brazilian president. I know him. I work in the Congress. He, 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 was, a, he was a member of Congress. For he dominates uh, social media. He dominates social media, yes, yes. And he still does. No one does social media like him. He's great. He's amazing. He, 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 he's a god. But he's facing another god here this year. This Sunday's election will be awesome, guys. I don't know if you're going to have, if you had a Super Bowl going on <laughs> in this TV and Brazilian Sunday election here, focus on Brazilian Sunday election. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> OK, uh, what else? In 2018, let me, let me go back a little bit here because there's something important that I missed. In 2018 election, uh, one of the 13 candidates was ex-president, former president Lula. Lula was candidate here. He was candidate. And by the... Just a second. Guys, stop fighting. It's my kids, okay? Yeah. Okay, stop fighting. Okay. Jordana, take care of your brothers. Okay. Uh, in 2018 election, president, ex former President Lula wo was candidate. He'd like to be candidate. On the polls, he appeared leading the polls. Like 40% in, in, in the month of April. The month of April, Lula had 38 percent, 38, while the second place Bolsonaro had 16, 38, 16. It was in April, but then Lula was arrested. Lula was arrested in April 7, April 7. 
The Labour Party took too long to nominate another name. Only by the eve of the elections, in the end of September, the Labour Party appeared with Fernando Haddad. Fernando Haddad, yeah. And this guy even had 29% of the votes. But Bolsonaro beat him on the second round, okay? Bom, well, Lula was arrested for one year and seven months. Uh, he went out from prison uh, two years ago. Now he is allowed to be candidate, okay? Uh, one important thing, uh, things are happening in Brazil all the time. There's something new that happened today, today. Today, the ex, the former Supreme Court minister who was responsible for Lula's arresting, Joaquim Barbosa, today, this same guy uh, recorded a video telling that he, is, uh, he approves Lula campaign. He's going to vote for Lula, asking support for Lula. The guy who arrested him, yeah. Bolsonaro has, uh, he's doing a miracle that is combining all adversaries. Adversaries. <laughs> I give up. You're uh, close. Yeah, okay, yeah. Is there a synonym? Opponent. Opo oh. <laughs> See? Bolsonaro, <laughs> uh, he's doing a miracle. He's getting together all their opponent. Opponent? Yeah. Opponent, yes, against him. Even this Joaquim Barbosa, it happened today, and it, it's big. This, it's big. Uh, some wanted this guy, Joaquim Barbosa, to be the candidate, and they will support him, but he didn't. No, I'm not a politician. I don't want to deal with politicians. But he's respected in Brazil, and this support is big. Well, uh, I, I brought this to you because I found it interesting. I didn't even, even notice this until preparing this speech for you this afternoon. But let's call these two patterns. In one of those patterns might break, might finish the sequence, which, which is, so far in Brazil, so far, all candidates who finish the first round in first place, were elected in the second round. Let's see this. All candidates who finished first round in first place were elected in second. All of them. Color 30, 53, I'm not going to through all of them, but all of them, trust me, all of them who trust finished first round, finish on the first, uh, uh, won the election. And the second pattern is, so far, all incumbent presidents who have tried to get reelected have been successful, successful. It also is true. It happened with Fernando Cardozo, 1994-1998. He was reelected. It happened with Lula in 2002-2006. He was reelected. It happened with Dilma Rousseff in 2010-2014. She also was reelected. The three who tried, the three were reelected. Now comes the fourth to try, Jair Bolsonaro. Is he going to be reelected? Number one. Another thing, I'm going to see in the next slide. Lula da Silva is ahead on the polls. It's not that close. They are, uh, they, it's not a narrow difference. They're straight, they are, um, Large, larging, yeah. larger in the, the difference, okay, in this, in this last days. And I'm going to say why. Well, this is the average voting intention. Uh, I got from the polling data here because 
to not bring, we have 24 institutions in Brazil, 24, working, making surveys, making research. So this one, they combine all of them. So it's an average, it's good. In case one is to that side or to that side, they make an average of all of them. So uh, it's a number we can trust, okay? Uh, today, September 27, what is the feeling of the Brazilians now? Former President Lula in red is with 43. We have a margin of two, down, two, up, well, but average 43. Bolsonaro is like increasing slowly, 33, 35, 36, but may not have time enough to get to Lula. Remembering, the, remembering you that are, these are only polls results, but it's a good, a good one because on average. We have 12 candidates. Is it 12? Yes, 12 candidates in 2022 elections. But I brought, besides Lula and Bolsonaro, I brought two others here, which is this purple here called Ciro Gomes with 7%, and Simone Tebet with 5%. This is important. Why? What is the movement in Brazil now? During all this speech this afternoon, I told that Bolsonaro joined his opponents, his opponents. And this is happening. The supports are happening every second now in Brazil, every second now. The pressure against Ciro voters and Simon Tebe voters are enormous. Pressure of what? Pressure of them to not vote for Ciro and to not vote for Simon and vote for Lula to finish this up in the first round. Something interesting happened last week. Uh, there is a Harvard professor called Stephen, Stephen Levisky, Levisky. He, he wrote, How Democracies Die. Uh, it's a New York Times bestseller, written in 25 languages, even in Portuguese. I, I brought this, this book with me. Uh, why I'm telling about this guy? He went to Brazil. I didn't know he was a Brazilian, he's interested in Brazil. Uh, and he participated in a television show, a television interview about the Brazilian elections. And he told something interesting that I think the Brazilians are taking it seriously. He said, I'm an American, but if I were you Brazilians, he said on TV, if I were you Brazilians, I would finish this in first round. You gotta do finish in first round. Why? Because otherwise you may, it may happen what happened in the United States, where the difference between Trump and Biden was close, and if that close a narrow result, it might become easier to contest, to complain. So Brazilians, if I were you, the professor, the Harvard professor said in Brazilian TV, if I were you, I would finish this now. First round is over, game over, fast. And it's easier to do it in the first round. Why? First round is difficult to complain about the results. Why is it difficult to complain? Because as I told here 15 minutes ago, on October 2nd, we're gonna be we're gonna, Brazil will elect the president. And besides the president, to one third of the Senate, all the 513 members of Congress, all 20, 27 governors, and all state legislatures. There's a lot of people being voted. So it's difficult to, con to contest because, oh, I was elected. I am not going to complain, I was elected. But it will not happen the second round, which is only exclusively, ex exclusive between those two. So it's make it easier. Professor Levisky said that, and 
This movement is happening in Brazil. We call in Brazil, voto útil, voto útil. I didn't find a word for voto útil in English. I am, I'm going to call it this uh, strategic tactic vote, which is, uh, let's say, what's your name? Isabella. Isabella. Ah, nice name. And I, I can't pronounce Isabella. <laughs> let's suppose Isabella like Simone Tebet. OK, I'm going to vote for her, OK? Just say OK. I'm going to vote for her? OK. What, what do you most like about her? <laughs> OK. OK, Isabella is going to vote for Simone Tebet. All right. But then she sees this. And she is thinking, OK, I'm going to say, but she's only thinking. You know what? I like Simone Tebet, but I know she will not going to win. You know why? You know what? I'm going to vote for Lula or for Bolsonaro. I'm going to vote for another one. So that's not the one I prefer. It's not. But it's called a strategic, a tactical vote. OK? So Isabella, so this movement. Uh, there is another poll that's, uh, that, was, uh, that was on today. It's not in this, in this because it's today. That shows this movement here already. Shows Ciro Gomes going down. Simone Tebet going down, and Lula going up. Lula going up with 46%. So the movement probably, they are leaving them, just like Isabella, and going to the first one to try to get it over on the first round. It's not easy. We are only talking about uh, surveys. surveys. We may all be surprised. But there's a lot of serving going on, OK? So uh, it's difficult. Uh, one may miss the other also, but not all of them. They have a lot at stake, OK? Well, we're almost about done. Uh, OK, I have something interesting here. I brought two campaign materials for you. Uh, in Brazil, we have uh, WhatsApp. You guys use WhatsApp? Yeah, I know. And I don't know why. The, the, world, the world use WhatsApp. Professor, you use WhatsApp, right? Yes. Uh, my American friends here, I mean, 100% American in the middle of the country who doesn't have any relation with the foreigners, when I ask them, they say, what's what, Gustavo? Never heard. Never heard. But it's strong in Brazil. It's strong. What's up? Everything is what's up. I was joking with Professor Lago. I don't check emails. I check what's up all the time. All the time. OK. Or what's up groups are <laughs> crazy, like crazy. You, 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 don't, you can't imagine. can't imagine. Crazy. So I, we receive things from one side and things from the other side. As a researcher, I mean all groups. And I, I don't speak a lot, like the silent spiral, let the guys speak. But I'm there learning and catching, learning and catching. OK, let's say about this here. This material was prepared by Lula's team. Lula's team. What does it say? It's about the strategic vote. See, it's in Portuguese, but I wrote in English myself in black, OK? It says like this. Lula can win in the first round. And it puts 48%. It's almost 50, right? First round. Then the Simone Tebet. Isabella, that's the Simone Tebet, the one you like it. <laughs> Simone Tebet and Ciro, and, and Ciro Gomes. Uh, OK, uh, sorry for the joke. I lost myself. Let's return to the top. Lula can win the first round, but if you vote for Ciro or Simone Tebet, who goes to the second round is him. Of course, Lula's campaign used a bad image of Bolsonaro. It's not going to put a handsome, strong guy here. 
<laughs> yeah, they joke with the uh, COVID masks. Okay, and that's their strategy. If you vote for them, he is going to the second round. That's a strategy. Lula's campaign is doing this a, a lot now. Another strategy now from the other side. The polls indicate that older people are the main Bolsonaro top supporters. People over 60 years old. So only today I receive this in all my groups, a lot, a lot. It says, take your grandparents to vote. Brazil needs them. Doesn't say the name of Bolsonaro, it says not, but we understand. There's the flag. Bolsonaro captures the Brazilian flag. If you use the Brazilian flag here, oh, you're Bolsonaro. Yeah, he, he, he was smart on that, okay? So uh, each campaign has, is using their strategies to take people on Sunday, October 2nd, to vote according to their interests. Uh, the last things I like to mention, guys, what can, what may influence Brazilian election on Sunday? One thing is that this useful vote, this strategic tactical vote, great chances, great chances are that the election finish on Sunday. Great chances are that Lula can go 50% plus one vote get the majority and finish all this in the first round. It may happen. There is a movement in that way, but we will only get to know it on Sunday night, on Sunday night. Ah, this is interesting also. Uh, as the Brazilian election is on uh, uh, elect electronic machines, we get to know the results in a couple hours. This is interesting too. When I uh, following American elections in Brazil, maybe take days, days. Oh, the state of, I don't know what, uh, will finish only in 12 days, I don't know. Uh, I said, oh my God, because in Brazil it's a couple, hour, couple hours, you got to know the result of the election, okay? Uh, so what can influence Sunday's election? The tactical strategic vote is important. Other thing is the attendance, the attendance. Lula, Lula campaign is trying to take uh, their top supporters groups. What are Lula's top supporters groups? Women, young people below 25 years old, the very poor, I mean it's very poor, and the illiterate, the illiterate. That's what they are, he's trying to take to, the, to Sunday's election. It's important for Lula uh, to bring them to vote. Other things that might influence the election is the economy. And this is no good news for Bolsonaro. In fact, it's not all his fault. The whole world had the COVID thing and uh, just like a lot of places, our economy is not doing so well. And if I take the misery index, the misery index is an economic indicator calculated using unemployment and annual inflation rate. And the misery index in Brazil now is higher than in any other election period. So this is bad news for Bolsonaro. Uh, other thing that might uh, interest in the two, two more people, uh, the other thing that may influence the election is the disapproval approval ratings, okay? And all the polls are putting Bolsonaro with a 51 disapproval rate, disapproval rate of 51 against 37, 38 of former President Lula, or Bolsonaro has more disapproval than the other, and it's decisive in a second round election 
or for this uh, this strategic tactical vote. And finally, Brazil has a huge television network called Globo. Globo network. It's not. I'm talking about the second largest world network television. It's huge. Global TV reaches 200 million people. Global TV reaches 99.5% of the Brazilians. Why I'm bringing all this? Bolsonaro and Globo, they're not opponents. They're enemies. They're enemies. And they, it, Global is going to carry a debate on Thursday nights. It's going to be, this is going to be great. This Thursday night debate at Global. Cannot miss, Fernando. Cannot miss. I already bought the popcorn. <laughs> yeah, popcorn. <laughs> uh, in a debate is important because in a debate, uh, uh, you reinforce positions, you have direct confrontation, and, and you try to convince people to go and vote for you. Well, I think that was all I had to bring here. Uh, but one last sentence for you guys is that regard, regardless of the results of Sunday's elections, regardless of the name that who will be chosen to preside over Brazil, or whoever will be the two names that will go to the second round, Brazil is ready. Brazil está listo. Brazil está pronto, as in Portuguese. Although it has only 33 years of an interrupted uh, democracy, interrupted democracy, interrupted corruption, interrupted democracy, Brazil has built strong institutions that have done very well through recent severe political economical crisis and for two impeachment proceedings. We have good institutions that will that will support that will mm, that uh, have support, strong institutions that will take whatever they have to take. And thank you for your attention, for your time, and for your patience. And I hope you had fun there, as I had fun here. Thanks. Questions? Uh, qu I didn't mention that, but the questions we have to be asked exclusive in Portuguese. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Okay. Um, what did Lula get arrested for? Uh, accepting bribes, big bribes. Uh, and he was really arrested. His case went through a lot of courts. And all judges, all judges uh, said they, he, he is guilty. He's really guilty. But, uh, well, their opponents got together against Bolsonaro. That's what happens. So Brazilians, uh, I know some Brazilians that will vote for Lula. They're not going to vote for Lula with proud. Ah, I'm proud. No, not proud is only the disapproval rate. I don't like Lula, but I like the other less, less. That's what's going to happen. Did I, did I hear you right that the Labor Party is leftist? Leftist. OK, so Bolsonaro is the, the conservative part of the political? Good party? question. Good question. I forgot to tell this. Sorry and thanks for let me give me time to say this. Bolsonaro is considered far right, very far right. Uh, have you heard of Donald Trump? <laughs> yeah. yeah, they're like twins. I have twins. I understand about twins. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. Now, in that same, underneath that, you have 32 parties. You said so. Could, could you, it may be not possible, but would you say half the parties are 
to the left and half are to the right, or can you answer that question? Yes. Uh, actually, it's a completely absurd for us to have 32 political parties. You don't have 32 different ideas <laughs> to have 32 political parties. I already thought about that. Maybe the max you have is seven, maybe seven. For instance, I'm center, I'm center right, I'm more right, I'm far right, and the same to left. I'm center, I'm maybe seven, but not 32. OK, so you mentioned, uh, how is this division? My opinion is that the far right is 25% of the Brazilians now, five, uh, far right. Oh, but, but Bolsonaro has 30, 34%, but they are, they are not all far right. But you have a far right, a far right to 25 you have left one third, 33%, and the others are very in between, in the middle. And it happens with the political parties. The political parties in Brazil, if they are not far right or not left, they tend to go where the power is. Right. Yeah, where the money is, where the, sure. the employees, and uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. You? Yeah, I was just kind of piggybacking off of the last question. I was wondering if the Brazilian people are kind of feeling like this is a choice between the lesser of two evils, considering um, you know, Lula has been, was uh, arrested for accepting bribes, and then you have, you know, um, you have uh, uh, Bolsonaro on the other end, you know, already dis disputing claims that he might lose the election, that it's going to be a, similar to a January 6th type thing where he's already disputing it if he loses. I'm wondering how the people feel that this is a choice between two people. Yes, what you say, it's true. Uh, uh, as I told here, uh, I have a lot of friends that are not, they don't, they are, they are not proud of going either one. I have friends going for Bolsonaro too. They said, Gustavo, I don't like that guy. I don't like that guy. Yeah. I don't agree with nothing he says. I know he's like a, he's rude, but he's not a thief. Uh, the other guy was in prison, in jail, right now, in jail. I cannot, I, I, don't, I don't agree to wake up on a Sunday and go to the ballots to vote for him. I don't do that. So it's different. It's not, that's why it's, it's interesting, this election. It's going to be exactly which one do you less this? I, I, don't, I don't even know. My, my brain got twisted. I don't even know how to say Portuguese, especially in English. Is the election of the least rejection. We would say lesser of two evils. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just like this, yeah. <laughs> professor. So I have a quick question. In some Latin American countries, like Mexico, where I come from, there is this kind of uh, interesting debate in the political sphere. Political scientists calling a fascist government of Jair Bolsonaro. And, and obviously, the way that we have been seeing the results in Italy kind of very alarming. And also thinking about the policies of Jair Bolsonaro, the way he handled the pandemic. Uh, yes. Years that he didn't want to put things in place, and he was very reluctant follow any guidelines. The policies that he had regarding women's rights are completely awful. The relationship with the army. Is, is there some kind of discussion in Brazil that, that Bolsonaro is part of this kind of very fascist, far right movements that are emerging in this current time? Yes, uh, we have. And that's why maybe the Harvard professor went to the TV network and say, oh, Brazilians, wake up. You're going to give this guy a chance to go to second round? You know, uh, look the world. Look what's going on. Uh, I don't even, I, it's difficult to think because uh, what I'm going to say here is interesting. I was part of his government. 
as professor said, during the COVID thing, I was chief of staff of the health minister, <laughs> Mandetta Tais Pazuello, the three ministers. I, I, I participate in everything. Uh, I saw a lot. Uh, uh, what you just mentioned, Professor, you're right. Uh, it's, it's, he's a difficult person. Uh, he's difficult. Some say he's, he's uh, one you cannot advise, an uh, uh, unadvisable person. For instance, uncontrolled, uncontrolled, something like this. And he is far right. As we, we told before, uh, he was kicked off. He, he's a captain from army. And he was took out from army because he was going to explode a bomb. Did you understand that? <laughs> he was going to explode, explode a bomb in the general's bathroom. Uh, general bathroom. So he is difficult. Uh, <laughs> but some guys here may, might be thinking, that's an absurd. Some may think, hmm, good idea. <laughs> I don't know, never thought about it. <laughs> Some people like him. The, uh, he is real. He's for real. He is, he's no fake. He has no makeup. He's that. He's that. That's Bolsonaro. You like it or you hate it. But I think as he's so spontaneous, he got too many uh, opponents more than one can handle. You cannot get more opponents that you can handle. And he got that. He's always fighting against one. And that's, this is so, so big that Supreme Court took him out of jail. That everyone, the, the judge, as I told you, the judge that convicted him said, I'm going to vote on him. He said this today. He said this today. So it's a different election. It's two evils. Uh, and, and what about maybe, is Brazilian worried about uh, January 6th, just like happened here? Some say, some say. Uh, I personally, as I know the government, I know the people, I don't think they will be able to. But you have a lot of people unsatisfied over there. They, they said to me, Gustavo, we will not accept if we not win. We will not accept. I heard this from, from huge people. Oh, my goodness. Let me go to the United States. <laughs> I'm just kidding. No, it's true. But the, the United States part is kidding. OK, one, one last question there. A combination, a combination. First of all, he's a rude person too. As I told you, he's, he says cuss words, cuss words, cuss words. Some may not like it, some like it. Uh, he, he's tough to woman too, right? He's tough to woman too. He, he makes jokes or whatever. Sexist. Yeah, sexist, yes. Uh, about the COVID thing, he didn't handle well. He didn't handle well. Uh, a lot of times he went on television. I work for a minister who started fighting, Mandetta. Uh, start fighting. Uh, I work with the health minister with three, min with three of them, three head ministers. One of them f got a fight with Bolsonaro and he went out. And then entered another one. I stayed. Then the third one was a general. I stayed. I stay as his chief of staff. I stay, um, and he's difficult to. He doesn't listen to you, so he does a lot of wrong, th wrong things. He also promised what I told before. He he said, if I'm elected, I'm not talk with political parties. And his top supporters <laughs> applaud this, approve that, and that was not what happened. He start talking with political parties and 
he, lo he lost appreciation, he lost supporters. Uh, so you mean, why is his disapproval rate so high? Uh, because he got so many opponents. I think the, I think as he got opponents, it's important for him. So his top supporters like it. Yes, yes, we are against, we, I don't know, we are against this Gustavo Pires. We are against this, yeah, yeah, people like it. But others don't like it. No, this guy is too much for us. See, he's not a bad guy, but he's a difficult guy. He's a difficult guy. He was a good member of parliament. He was for eight years. He complains. He's different. Not everyone who is in the parliament is good for executive. Executive is different. Yeah? There are different jobs. Sure. In the executive, you must do. In the parliament, no, you, you cannot. You can. This is wrong. This is something stealing here. Hey, everyone, this is wrong. But you cannot do this in the executive. You got trouble, right? OK. Well, I hope you got something from Brazil. Very much. It's an interesting country. I'll be around, around in, in, in case you have any questions. And in case you have a second round, let's meet again. <laughs> yeah. Bye-bye.